Thank you very much, Fidi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fidi. Bonjour, good morning. I will give my talk in English. My French is not so good uh, to talk about the technical matters. Um, I'm going to talk about concentrated solar thermal energy and I will go through aspects of optics, heat transfer and chemistry. It will be, so I hope everybody will find something interesting in this uh, presentation. So let's start with the source. All solar radiation comes from the star, from our sun, that is far away. It takes about eight minutes for the solar photons to arrive to the Earth's orbit. And while this radiation is transferred through the space, the flux, a very large flux, more than 63 megawatts per square meter at the surface of the sun, decreases to about one kilowatt per square meter at the Earth's orbit. And when the radiation passes through the atmosphere, it undergoes further um, interactions with molecular gases there, with, uh, and then we have even less on the Earth's surface of that radiation. In uh, Australia, there is the phenomenon of the ozone hole, which is closing, fortunately, but because of that, there is more UV than elsewhere, maybe um, except some uh, high altitude locations, like in Chile. Uh, so there is more UV radiation, and for that we had measured more than one kilowatt per square meter of direct insulation. It was even up to 1.1 kilowatt per square meter in January. Uh, so this is the Australian summer. Now, not only the magnitude of the flux, solar radiation flux is decreasing, but also the spectrum is slightly uh, changed due to interactions with water vapor, with carbon dioxide, ozone, and some particles, which is local. About two or three weeks ago, I was in Cyprus, and I was told about the problem of the dust from Sahara. So all the technology I'm talking today about apply to mostly dry, arid, desert areas. There is a uh, phenomenon or there is a uh, characteristics of desert radiation, uh, how much DNI, direct normal insulation we have there. When Sahara is dusting, unfortunately it's blocking um, a lot of DNI, so we see haze, this, this, a lot of scattering there. It's an undesired phenomenon for concentrating solar energy utilization. Now, the, we believe, well, um, solar energy is a practically unlimited source of primary energy. We believe that at a large scale, its utilization will be negligible for the natural environment, and it has a high exergy content. More than 90% of solar radiation can be converted into electricity or mechanical energy. But it also arrives with this relatively low energy flux. One kilowatt per square meter is nothing, so we need to magnify it, and that's why we concentrate. It is non-uniformly distributed on the Earth's surface. Most solar radiation arrives, DNI, direct normal insulation, is um, uh, measured in the solar belt, and the farther we go away from the equator, the less uh, radiation will be having in, um, in high uh, latitudes areas. And solar radiation is intermittent with respect to daily and seasonal cycles, which is very inconvenient because for any industrial applications we like steady sources of energy. So we have to deal with those transient characteristics. Let's do a simple exercise. Let's assume that the average annular solar flux is 270 watts per square meter, which is eight hours of solar irradiation divided by 24 hours, so that's average. Um, we can convert this radiation with thermal efficiency of about 20%, which is a conservative assumption. Then to cover all our energy needs, which in 2019 was um, 19 terawatts, we would need to collect solar and convert solar radiation from a square of 590 by 590 square kilometers. So this would be some small square in uh, Sahara or in Australia or somewhere in uh, Chile or perhaps in New Mexico. We have much more resources than what we need to actually um, provide we need for our civilization. 
This motivates people to work on different aspects of solar energy conversion. Uh, for, we can use solar radiation directly, like here we have windows, and then the more windows we have, the more electricity we offset for lighting. We can convert it in thermal processes at low temperatures and at high temperatures. We can convert it in photoelectric conversion, in photovoltaic applications, and we can convert it in photochemical conversion when energy of the photon is directly used to drive chemical reactions. Um, for example, in artificial or natural photosynthesis, in photolysis, or in photocatalysis. And in my talk, I'm going to focus on the photothermal conversion at high temperatures for applications in production of electricity and other chemi and chemical processing. Now, the upper efficiency limit that, is, uh, uh, that applies to solar concentrated solar thermal energy conversion is calculated as a product of two efficiency components. The efficiency of a perfectly insulated black body receiver, and this is the, here in our hypothetical system, we have a black body receiver here, working in tandem with a Carnot engine, which is an ideal thermal machine, which is here and rejects heat to the uh, ambient or to the cold reservoir. So the, this efficiency can be plotted. The absorption efficiency is represented by blue lines and the absorption efficiency decreases with receiver temperature because there is more re-radiation. Then the Carnot efficiency increases with the receiver temperature because of the um, receiver temperature being here in the denominator in the second term. And when we multiply the blue lines with the green lines, we obtain the red lines, which is the, this theoretical efficiency limit. Now we can see that this theoretical efficiency limit increases with the increasing uh, receiver temperature and with the increasing concentration ratio of, the optical, of an optical concentrator. Okay? So now how can we obtain this <coughs> high <coughs> receiver temperatures and how can we obtain this uh, concentrated fluxes? Um, I will come back to that. We can use solar concentrators and I'm sure all of you have seen some of them. We can use parabolic troughs with concentration ratios between 10 and 100, relatively low. Central tower systems with heliostat fields with concentration ratios between 100 and 1000. Parabolic dishes with concentration ratios between 100 and 10,000. And then these are the typical industrial installations right now. For research, they are inconvenient to be used because they are large, they depend on weather conditions. We would like to have some equipment where it is in controlled environment and we minimize moving parts and so on. And such facilities are the solar furnaces. The, here is the one in France, in Odeo, at CNRS Promes. I was working there for five weeks in 2015. It's a very nice area in the mountains. Um, the solar simulators, like the one we built at ANU, and I have just learned that here at the University of Reims there will be another one. Um, and if these fluxes provided by these research facilities are not high enough, we can always use secondary optics to magnify, such as compound parabolic concentrators or CPCs. Now let me go back to my previous slide. The plot I'm showing here was first published in Science by Professor Fletcher in 1977. Professor Fletcher was a faculty member at the University of Minnesota where I used to work and where Fidi, uh, Professor Andrea Nalisoa was a visiting professor, twice I believe. Um, Professor Fletcher published this uh, in relation to a study on water thermochemical water splitting. Now, he is the doctoral supervisor of my supervisor, Aldo Steinfeld from ETH Zurich, and my former laboratory head, Robert Palumbo, who was the head of the lab, solar lab at Pau Scherer Institute in Switzerland. Now he is back in America. Professor Fletcher himself obtained a PhD with Herbert Brown, who worked in chemistry, and he got the Nobel Prize in 1979 for the organic chemistry of boron. So, 
there is going to be a, some chemistry aspect in my talk too. Now, the concentrated solar thermal technologies are suited to many areas on this planet. We, whenever we have high values of direct normal irradiation, uh, we can basically consider deploying them, such as deserts of North and South Africa, Mediterranean, Arabian Peninsula and the Middle East, parts of India, Northwest and Central Australia, high plains of Andean countries, Northeast Brazil, North Mexico, Southwest of the United States, a lot of them. And China is not, or Asia here is perhaps not so explicitly mentioned, but there is also, an, in, uh, uh, I mean Far East Asia, but there is a very growing industrial sector in that field in concentrated solar thermal energy right now, probably which will take over the developments as well elsewhere in the world in the near future. Now, let me tell you some character, about some characteristics of those technologies. They utilize the complete solar spectrum in contrast to photovoltaics where we were, or to artificial photosynthesis, photoelectrochemical systems and so on. Here we work with any radiation that is absorbed by the receiver. The solar thermal technologies make use of common materials such as steel, glass, ceramics, salts, water, carbon dioxide and air. And because of that, we depend less on rare earths and on precious metals. So currently the world is heading towards electrification. We, talk, we hear a lot about switching to electrical propulsion, hydrogen with electrolyzers, but there is one aspect that is not explicitly mentioned anywhere actually. The rare earth and precious metal markets are already controlled nearly, the, the vast majority of this market is controlled by China. In the past there was the issue of the fossil fuel security because the fossil fuel supply was coming from few countries. Now the Chinese companies basically dominate this market. There are other companies in a little bit in Australia and um, then the, the industry is trying to get up on its feet in the United States. But um, the production is actually concentrated in China. The solar thermal technologies go a little bit around this issue and therefore there will, it's, um, they may add to the diversity of renewable energy technologies. Now, these technologies are compatible with large capacity thermal energy storage for both base load and dispatchable operation. And they are compatible with main industrial applications requiring either this, um, um, requiring thermal energy inputs, okay? Even with the state of the art CSP technologies, on, we can cover uh, all our needs for electricity from an area uh, by taking radiation from about 1.5% of dry and semi-dry areas. So the technology is there. The issue is with the cost and reliability, which is a lot of engineering. And of course, we have to work also on improving the efficiencies of, the te of these technologies. In contrast to photovoltaics, the, the efficiency of a solar concentrated solar thermal plant goes hand in hand with the cost because the higher is the efficiency, the less of the heliostat fields I will need and they are expensive. So if we work harder on the receiver, we will need less of those mirrors and less glass, less steel to have the same output. The field is growing, so here is the map produced by Solar Paces in July 2022. It's a little bit small here. Um, showing the operational and plants and plants under construction around the world. And we see that uh, many of, there are many operational systems in North America, in Europe. Spain is you know, the global leader. Uh, we have the Moroccan uh, uh, plant in, in Western Sahara. But there is a vast development right now going on in Asia, especially in China. China announced about a year ago um, about 30 mega projects where solar thermal plants will be uh, constructed, developed, 
including thermal energy storage, and they will be hybridized with photovoltaic systems. China has a new law that the photovoltaic systems can only be mm, built if they work with storage. And it turns out thermal storage that is provided by solar thermal plants is the best match. And this is driving now the development there. So the Solar Paces website will list all these details. It's very interesting. Um, it's a really big market growing there. The field is also growing because we have more and more labs where specialized research infrastructure is built, such as the high flux solar simulators. I showed you the one previously briefly. I'm going to show you more soon. And there will be, so here we see the map of the solar simulators in the world, including the one I built previously at the University of Minnesota and at the Australian National University. And then soon I look forward to seeing the one in Reims that will be constructed here. Um, so beside that, we can also produce maps of this type um, for solar furnaces and other smaller scale research facilities. It's a lot of um, research that is taking on right now there, and I hope it will, um, it will keep growing. Now, let me show you two examples of these high flux solar simulators. The one we built in Australia consists of 18 radiation units, each comprising two and a half kilowatt electric xenon lamps with the total electric power consumption of 45 kilowatts. And this simulator delivers peak fluxes in excess of 11 megawatts per square meter. When it was new, actually, we got more than 20 megawatts per square meter, but this was too much. The simulator acted like a laser cutting tool, so it was impossible to heat um, materials without actually having hot spots and damaging them. We intentionally defocused the lamps to lower the peak flux and have it more uniform in the focal plane. But this is a very small facility compared to the simulator on steroids built by the German Aerospace Center in Jülich, um, near Cologne, which consists of 149 units, radiation units, with the peak flux exceeding 10 megawatts per square meter, but of course much more power available. So much power that they can run experiments in three receiver or reactor chambers simultaneously. And that's, of course, the largest facility in the world right now. Now, let me now tell you a little bit about the fundamentals of the physics of concentrated solar thermal systems. We have here very, multi, very different space scales and, length and um, time scales. At the largest scales of the solar collectors, we have transport of energy, mostly in form of, or exclusively in form of electromagnetic radiation. So we have the solar radiation which is collected and delivered to a receiver. Then we have the receiver scale, down to components of the receiver scale, down to the features of those components, such as particles, struts, pores, and so on. When we move from larger to the smaller scales, there, will, there is more and more energy transport in form in, use, um, with matter-bound uh, transport phenomena, such as conduction, convection, heat transfer, and relatively less radiation. At this larger scale, there is only radiation, and then we have less and less radiation, but we have also conduction, convection, um, because we, deal, we have here uh, different mass fluxes as well, especially in chemically reacting systems. So now I will start the overview of specific problems according by following this length scale, I will start at the collector scale, and then I will go down to, to the receiver reactor scale, and then I will uh, summarize with some non <laughs> with two problems that are actually at the global scale. So I'm going back to the very large scales. Now, um, 
to design and model the uh, solar concentrators, which can have very different shapes, geometries, and characteristics, we typically use um, radiative transfer simulations uh, for sol selected solar positions on the sky to obtain um, the hourly, daily, monthly, and annual optical performance maps. We typically use Monte Carlo method, ray tracing methods, either developed in-house. I have always pushed my students to write their own Monte Carlo codes to learn something about this very nice and useful method. Or we can use third-party uh, tools such as Tonatius, Saltis, Tracer. They are capable of optical simulations of those entire systems. We, we typically take into account atmospheric attenuation, interactions with imaging and non-imaging optical components. So non-imaging optical components could be for secondary concentrators, such as those compound parabolic concentrators I showed previously. And these days there is a very fast progress in machine learning and artificial intelligence methods. These methods are very well suited to be combined with the optical simulation tools to automate the problem, to automate the uh, studies of optimize, oops, of the study of optimizing those very large uh, concentrator systems. And I will show you soon a study where we didn't use any AI or machine learning method. We did it by hand, and now we start to. Uh, think how we can go to the next level. So let me start, let me show you the problem where we actually, where we had to design a heliostat field, a polar heliostat field for a solar tower with an optional compound parabolic concentrator. And the research question was, what are the cost optimal layouts, their optical efficiency, and the levelized cost of exergy? So to do that, my student, former doctoral student, Lifeng Lee, developed her own Monte Carlo simulations, her own optimization code, and they, she coupled them. First, she started to, with an algorithm to actually define a heliostat field. We take a large surround field, then we cut a small section, and then based on op preliminary optical simulations, we identify only well-performing heliostats, the blue ones are not well performing, which are tossed away, and we end up with a starting field, uh, starting field for optimization. Now, there are different parameters in this problem to take into account, and I'm not going to bore you with all the detailed technical explanations. I'm going to give you only a top level overview of this problem. So, we can vary the tower height, we can vary the acceptance angle of the, compound, uh, of the compound parabolic concentrator, or we can uh, vary the tilt angle of that uh, concentrator. Depending on the parameters, the fields can be elliptical, parabolic, or hyperbolic. Okay? So, and this geometry, this uh, geometries change from one to the other depending on the combination of the parameters. Of course, we don't want to end up with any fields that are semi-infinite because that would be impractical. So we apply some secondary criterions to truncate the fields to be practical, stay on Earth. After uh, many simulations with ray tracing and optimization, Lifeng was able to find the optical efficiencies in function of the receiver temperature for those systems without CPC and with the CPC. And she was able to find the, the best performing systems without first paying at any attention to the cost. And in the next step, she also applied the Exergy, the cost of exergy criterion, and as a result, she was able to find the uh, optical and character uh, optical efficiencies and the levelized cost of exergy in function of the receiver temperature for the systems without the CPC and with the CPC. To produce these plots, it was actually not so trivial. So for the cases without the CPC, there were more than 10,000 simulations 
and the optical layouts are those dark blue um, cost optimal layouts are those dark blue dots um, at the, um, in these plots. For the systems with the compound parabolic concentrator, she ran more than 40,000 simulations and then she identified those minimal uh, cost configurations. It is a lot of computing here and indeed it would be much better if we knew already how to apply neuronal networks, machine learning, because uh, um, that could perhaps save on the computational time to go right away to the desired solution when the, when the um, algorithm is first trained and then... Uh, but by that time we were not yet into machine learning and this will be the next step in our research. Here I'm showing the resulting optimal cost optimal configurations for the systems without the CPC in function of receiver temperature and with the CPC with function of the receiver temperature. So we can see that for both cases when the receiver temperature increases the field decreases which means the total power of such a plant decreases. It's, it's getting more and more expensive when we want to obtain high temperature on the receiver and then there will be many heliostats that we should remove because their optical efficiency is too low and it costs too much to build them so it's better to have a small system but well performing for these high temperatures. Now the interesting part is also that when we don't have any CPC for example, for the receiver at 1800 Kelvin, the field is relatively small, so we will have little power there. But when we add CPC, suddenly we enable those not well performing heliostats because CPC can take the less concentrated sunlight and put it still into the receiver. And that's the advantage of having the secondary concentrator. But it comes with the penalty of maintaining it. It works under extreme fluxes, megawatts per square meter, so it needs cooling. The surface has to be always perfectly reflecting. 1% of thermal loss on the CP surface immediately generates a very large amount of waste heat, and that can lead easily to the damage and melting of that device. So massive water cooling is needed there, plus no dust deposition and some other practical considerations. Good. Let me move now from the collector scale to the receiver scale. So at the receiver, typical receivers that you will find in concentrating solar thermal systems are volumetric receivers, cylindrical receivers, external receivers, cavity receivers, and blader receivers, which combine the, a little bit the functions of an external receiver with the cavity receiver, because between the blades we have something like a mini enclosure. And there is another interesting type of receivers, the falling particle receivers, for example, the one proposed by Sandia National Labs. And the project is now being scaled up to be and tested, so the receiver is tested on their solar tower in Albuquerque. In that receiver, we have hot particles, um, we have part ceramic particles falling in the receiver cavity, and they are exposed to the concentrated flux coming through the aperture to this cavity. Then the heat is stored um, in the particles and it can be used for power generation or it can be used for chemical processing. I would like here to make some segue and mention the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute where we also have studied receivers but also concentrators and power blocks. This program is now actually ending but it started in 2012. It was a 100 plus million uh, program co-sponsored by the or mainly sponsored by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency and the objective was to facilitate the commercial uptake of CSP technologies and systems within Australia and internationally. CSIRO was the leading institution and which is the Australian CNRS and we had some uh, other partners, including uh, partners from the US. Now, this is the model plan that was developed by, the, uh, by Inastri with, with the collectors, receivers, 
heat exchanger, and then storage and power block. And the interesting part for that model plan that you can see here is that the heat transfer fluid was liquid sodium. The idea is not new and is not invented by the solar thermal community. France has many nuclear power plants. Sodium was and is used in some nuclear reactor as the heat transfer fluid. Um, there are also other liquid metals used, um, such as um, boron, for example. And then um, with sodium, we have to have a heat exchanger because then we have um, here uh, molten salts in the storage, and then we have the power block with supercritical CO2. So there was a lot of science and engineering over more than uh, 10 years within this program with this uh, in different institutions. What I want to show you only is the um, study or the practical implementation of the idea of sodium used as a heat transfer fluid by the plant located in Gemalong, New South Wales in Australia by the company Vas Solar. This plant has five modules, heliostat fields, each having its own sodium receiver. And there is also thermal storage in form of sodium. And the turbine, uh, made, the turbine was bought by, from Skoda. And sodium normally is a solid metal, but then it melts at above 90 degrees Celsius. And not, it's not only about the liquid sodium. Um, I showed you this, I mentioned a little bit that there are transient characteristics in solar thermal plants. So sometimes there is more sun, sometimes less, and sometimes we produce hot spots. So it means if we overheat the receiver locally somewhere, we can actually exceed the desired temperature. This may lead to boiling sodium. These are undesired effects. But boiling was studied um, for uh, these applications. Boiling in uh, uh, sodium was studied by my other doctoral students, Sid Artier, who investigated only numerically. By the time he graduated, the lab was not ready. It's not easy to work with liquid sodium. It's uh, a little bit dangerous, especially if it's hot and it catches vapor, moisture from the air. It goes on fire immediately. Um, so sodium was studied and he studied, for example, the effect of wall superheat, which is the difference between the saturation temperature and the actual temperature of the wall, and how this will affect the mechanics of growing a bubble in a boiling process. I could have, or maybe better, Siddharth could deliver here a long lecture on this uh, subject, but uh, I only signal the topic, and it's still an open topic, in particular the experimental aspects of studying sodium boiling for solar thermal receivers. The next, um, heat, the next problem I have chosen here is the use of ceramic particles as the heat transfer medium in falling particle receivers. I have already shown this schematic of the Sandia receiver. My another student, Jing Jing Chen, studied the heat transfer characteristics and solar energy conversion in a falling particle receiver, open receiver, um, using numerical methods. Again, there, is no, there was no experimental validation at that time, except, um, except certain aspects, such as uh, thermal properties or simplified configurations. So she developed a model that uh, is in a pseudo 2D or actually three-dimensional model, but the third dimension was equal to unity. Um, she has the solar radiation model to say black body at 5,777K. The ceramic particles were characterized with regard to their optical and radiative properties. And they, in this problem, the ceramic particles were polydispersed. She applied the classical conservation equations for the gas and solid phases. And the novelty of this study at the more fundamental level is that because it's a polydispersed system, and in a polydispersed system, particles under intense irradiation can be heated at very different rates. So she developed a modified equation of the radiative transfer, accounting for the different particle groups 
with different sizes in the emission, attenuation and scattering terms. And she wrote her own Monte Carlo code to basically solve this problem in the receiver and couple the radiative um, simulations with the uh, CFD code MFIX developed by the Department of Energy under the Department of Energy um, in the US, um, where we have the uh, combination of the Eulerian and Lagrangian methods for the treatment of the two phases. Okay? So this was the this is probably one of the most accurate models where radi in the radiative part we account for different temperatures of particles of different sizes and in the CFD part, the hydrodynamics simulation part in MFIX, we trace those particles in groups called the particle um, cells um, exact to find their locations and uh, concentrations in the receiver. It took a lot of computational effort here again, so um, Jing Jing used some uh, supercomputing facilities. Now I'm showing only selected results. The gas phase velocity fields in the receiver, so this is the aperture where the concentrated solar radiation enters, and then we have the effects of um, different uh, parameters. Then at the bottom, particles enter at the top and then are discharged at the bottom. This is the gas phase, but you see the, clearly where the particles are falling because the gas velocities are disturbed. And we can see here the particles themselves, their velocities from the inlet to the outlet in, for selected particle sizes. Okay. Jing Jing also calculated, of course, uh, the volumetric heat transfer rates and temperature profiles. So radiative heating for different particle groups with different characteristic sizes and overall. This is the negative divergence of the radiative flux, which means the net radiation absorbed by particles uh, as they are exposed to the solar flux and the convective loss from the particles to the gas. And here we have the temperatures of the particles of different sizes and the gas phase. Now, you see here a lot of noise. And the reason is because we have these small particles and the more particle groups we have, there is less and less thermal inertia within each size group. And then the numerical solution will oscillate. Plus, the particles are moving and there is uh, also turbulence is included in this uh, simulation. So all this together was a little bit difficult actually to handle. And we had a, in the final publication, which appeared in Applied Mathematical Modeling, we had a very long but very valuable exchange process with the reviewers, where both the reviewers and ourselves advance our understanding what's going on with this model. Of course, with the improving computing power, this will be easier and easier to do in the future. But uh, the, again, the small thermal inertia of the small part, relatively small particles in this problem moving in a turbulent gas flow under intense irradiation, even without chemistry, is still very challenging. I would say super challenging. Okay? So um, there is still uh, plenty of room to improve and advance these methods towards a better reliability of the results. Now I would like to switch to the next part of my presentation and finally to talk a little bit about the chemical aspects of uh, solar energy conversion. Let me start with the general description or the general introduction of a any thermochemical decomposition reaction. Let's assume we have a component AB and uh, at high temperature it is decomposed into um, components uh, or species A and B. Now, um, this requires heat, it's an endothermic reaction. So for most, for many thermochemical reactions, the enthalpy of the composition is almost constant with the temperature. However, when we increase the temperature, the contribution of heat to the enthalpy change of reaction increases. And this, the, this is the entropy change of the reaction, that's the temperature of the reaction. Why the um, amount of electricity that we would need to uh, supply to this reaction decreases with the uh, temperature. 
So at some very high temperatures, any compound can be thermalized. Water, carbon dioxide will be dissociated just using heat. At low temperature, for example, when we want to dissociate water, we will use water electrolysis to produce hydrogen, and the heat that is generated in the electrolyzer, the waste heat, is sufficient to provide the T delta S at that um, low temperature. Now, when we increase the temperature, this is how we arrive somewhere where the high temperature electrolyzers work. They use, um, still they use electricity, but less than at low temperature, and heat is um, also consumed in this reaction. At some point, uh, there is not enough waste heat from the electrolyzer due to uh, joule heating, so we need to supply external heat to hi a high temperature electrolyzer. Now, for water, we can calculate this theoretical decomposition temperature, which will be more than 4,000 Kelvin. That's, of course, impractical. Similarly, that would be for carbon dioxide. We can um, thermally decompose water and CO2 at lower temperatures by basically removing hydrogen or carbon monoxide from a reacting system, shifting equilibrium a little bit. So the temperature will drop to on something like 2,500 Kelvin, where we can already extract hydrogen or CO2, but this is still very high. Nevertheless, Professor Fletcher, the same person I showed to you before, he built a reactor, thermolysis reactor, where water was thermalized, and then there was a porous zirconia fell to separate hydrogen from oxygen and then uh, to separate these gases. But there is a fundamental problem with this approach. Um, any leak of hydrogen and oxygen leads again to recombination and release of heat, and this process becomes unstable or even dangerous. Okay? So uh, we can also calculate the, the composition temperatures for metal oxides, and here we started uh, with zinc oxide at 2340K, all the way to cerium dioxide at 5000K, which would be a reduction to pure cerium and oxygen. But at lower temperatures, cerium dioxide will also reduce to um, lower valence uh, cerium dioxide. So I'm going now to show you how we can use this idea of combining thermal decomposition, metal decomposition of uh, water, metal decomposition thermally, to develop so-called thermochemical redox cycles. The redox cycles are part of the strategies to produce solar fuels using concentrated solar energy. Besides, we have this high temperature thermolysis. We can also produce solar fuels by reforming cracking or gasification of fossil fuels or biomass, even better, because then it's a sustainable process. And concentrated solar energy can also be used for calcination, ammonia production, metallurgical processes, and CO2 capture from flue gases. Concentrated solar energy is not suitable to capture CO2 from the atmospheric air, because the concentration of CO2 in the atmospheric air is so low that the process at high temperature is very inefficient. And I'm going to show you some other alternatives later. The goal of our work is to maximize the efficiency of conversion of solar radiation into any of the products, fuels or the commodity materials. For all these processes, there have been many different solar thermochemical reactors developed. Generally, we have two groups of those reactors, directly heated and indirectly heated. In directly heated reactors, solar radiation heats directly the chemical reaction site. For example, in the reactor for zinc oxide decomposition, ceria reduction and oxidation, or steam reforming or dry reforming of methane developed at DLR in Germany. Indirectly heated reactors uh, use concentrated solar radiation, which is first absorbed on a surface of a tube or a wall, and then we have the chemical reactions such as calcination and cement production, um, thermo, uh, thermal, th carbothermal reduction of metal oxides, and reduction of metal oxides. In this reactor, I'm going to explain a little bit more later. So, now I'm coming back to the idea of thermochemical redox cycles. They, um, basically, they have been progressed 
uh, quite a lot in the 70s in relation to the utilization of the waste heat in nuclear plants to produce hydrogen. Now the idea is that we first reduce a metal oxide and the reduced metal oxide is then oxidized with either water or CO2 or just oxygen to produce hydrogen, carbon monoxide or nothing. In the case when we oxidize with oxygen, there will be more heat release. And that third route is, a part, is the strategy to store heat at very high temperatures. If I reduce a metal oxide, let's say at 1200 Celsius, and then I burn it in oxygen or air, I will again, theoretically, I can obtain temperatures close to 1200 Celsius. We have stoichiometric versus non-stoichiometric cycles, so depending on what this factor delta is in the, if it's unity or a fractional number, and volatile versus non-volatile, depending if the products are gases or solids. For example, if we decompose zinc, zinc oxide at more than 2000 Kelvin, both zinc and oxygen are gaseous products. When we reduce cerium dioxide at about 1500 Celsius, the reduced cerium dioxide, non-stoichiometric metal oxide, is solid, while oxygen is gaseous. So there have been many cycles studied, the ferrite cycle, the zinc oxide cycle, Syria cycle, very intensely investigated, hercinite cycle, uh, both Syria and hercinite ended up in science um, by different groups, perovskite cycle, sulfur iodine process from the nuclear uh, sector, Manganese oxide cycle also studied in the nuclear sector and the University of Tokyo 3 cycle. Again, Japan is very strong or was very strong with nuclear engineering and they developed this cycle to utilize the waste heat from nuclear reactors to produce hydrogen. Recently, my <coughs> other student, Shali, um, studied hypothetical materials that we could build by modifying thermodynamic properties of those materials, entropy and enthalpy, to see if we could find better efficiencies than those now reported theoretically for Syria or for zirconia dope Syria and some other materials. So basically what she did, she assumed the, a hypo, that there could be a hypothetical material with the same thermodynamic characteristic profile as the existing materials, but then she shifted them to um, in this plot. And then she was looking for how much efficiency we can actually get there if we do any materials science and research to find better materials. And she found out that, for example, for Syria, the state-of-the-art theoretical efficiency of 18.5%, subject to many assumptions that others may have done differently, and my numbers here may be lower than if you compare to literature, I have to say that clearly, um, this would increase to 32.7, but that material doesn't exist. So she published the requirements for creating better redox materials towards more efficient water and carbon dioxide splitting and hopefully there will be material scientists who will jump on this and they will look perhaps by first principle calculations which molecules can be combined to establish those better materials. Now I mentioned Syria which is now very popular in the solar thermochemical community. In the first step Syria is used to is reduced, oxygen is released, and in the second step, cerium dioxide, reduced, the reduced one, is used to split water to produce hydrogen or to split CO2 to produce carbon monoxide. This material has been proposed in various morphological forms and coming with very different thermophysical properties, especially from the optical and radiative transfer point of view, but also mass transfer point of view. Um, and accordingly, there have been different reactors. The one developed by ETH and Caltech and published in science at Sandia National Universities. Here we have particles in contrast to the porous structure and at the University of Minnesota with uh, mater the material sitting inside the tubes. Now, the team of ETH took it probably the longest way. They built the entire system with 
two reactors working in, in tandem, when one reactor realizes the reduction step, the other one realizes the water or CO2 splitting step, and the solar flux is alternately moved, the focus is moved by the movable mirror working in tandem with this parabolic dish. It was built on the roof of mechanical engineering of um, ATTH Zurich, and then the water vapor and CO2 come from the atmospheric air only. So this basically, there is a unit of water and CO2 capture from the air using the process commercialized by um, the company Climeworks, a startup from ETH. The reactor technology is now being commercialized by another company, another startup company, Synhelion. And then the syngas is fed into a mini fischer tropsch synthesis unit for obtaining hydrocarbons. Kerosene was, or jet fuel was the main product of the, or the, the objective product of the European Union project to get, together with DLR. But they also have done methanol and I think some other um, fuels, fuel types. So this work ended up in nature as the demonstration of the entire system using only air and sun as the input. No water from the tap, no CO2 from the tap. In fact, uh, we celebrated Professor Steinfeld's uh, contributions to the field of solar thermochemistry on the occasion of his 60th birthday at, in 2020 at the AICHE symposium, which was planned to be in San Francisco, but we had to go virtual because of the pandemics. And this, uh, this year we closed the special issue of solar energy resulting from that symposium. So at the ANU we took the cerium, Syria cycle further and we mixed Syria with vanadia. Vanadia is known uh, for its electrocatalytic processes, is used in the flow batteries. Um, so we thought let's try to combine the two and see how they will behave together. We found out that actually 25% of vanadia in Syria works very well to produce synthesis gas and we demonstrated on in, with different morphological forms from powder level to reticulate porous ceramics level. Here you see the material before cycling and after cycling tested in our lab, thermochemical benchtop lab with a gold IR furnace um, with the process called the partial methane oxidation coupled to redox cycling. Um, the next topic I would like to briefly present is the solar thermochemical energy storage. In 2018, um, our collaborator Alicia Bayon, who is back from Australia now in Spain, did this techno-economic study to see, to study the cost um, of different thermochemical energy storage systems in function of the discharge temperature of the storage system for working together with subcritical steam ranking cycles, supercritical CO2, air brighton or combined cycles for carbonates, metal oxide redox systems, uh, metal oxide chemical looping combustion, hydroxide, hydroxide systems and molten salts. At ANU we studied a system based on manganese ferrite oxides, mixed oxides, where we, this metal oxide was reduced in a solar reactor and then reduced particles were supposed to be fed into oxidation reactor where heat could be released at temperatures above 1000 degrees Celsius. The novel material, not pure manganese oxide, but manganese oxide combined with ferrites, was developed at the University of Colorado Boulder in the group of Professor Alan Weimer. We built a solar reactor for that process to realize the reduction tested in our solar simulator. The particles were placed in the reactor here in the form of a packed bed. And what I'm showing here are two plots. The plot when first we studied pure thermal characteristics of this reactor with inner alumina particles and then with the actual reacting particles you see oxygen released and the solid lines are experiment, the dashed lines is the model developed by my other doctoral student Bo Wang um, who is now an uh, associate professor at Harbin Institute of Technology. This reactor's efficiency peaked 
at 9%. I mentioned a little bit about CO2 capture and I said previously that concentrated solar thermal energy is not suitable to drive processes for CO2 capture from the air because high temperature processes would be very inefficient with this very low concentration of CO2, about 400 ppm. Um, Climeworks, the startup from ETH, they developed the process that is low temp relatively low temperature process. It can take waste heat, geothermal heat or low temperature heat to capture CO2 from the air. But uh, at ANU and previously at the University of Minnesota, we did study the use of concentrated solar energy for capturing CO2 from flue gases, where the concentration ratios are relatively high, between typically 10 and 15 percent, sometimes even higher. And for that uh, process, for that uh, problem, we developed a process based on calcination, carbonation, chemical looping with carbonates. We considered calcium, strontium, manganese, um, magnesium, barium and other uh, metals for the carbonates and we then studied actually experimentally mostly calcium oxide. The advantage of this process is it has almost the triple storage capacity if we want to store energy uh, because this process can be dual use, CO2 capture and thermal energy storage as well. And the material is very cheap, about 10 Australian cents per kilogram, but it degrades and loses reactivity. So the calcination itself was studied long time ago with two reactors at Pau Scherer Institute in a project led by Dr. Anton Meyer there. This was during my doctoral study time. At ANU we advanced this to cycling calcination carbonation using one reactor with gas inlet, gas outlet, concentrated solar radiation coming here through the aperture. This is the photo of the reactor in the solar simulator and it operates by realizing the cycling calcination, CO2 is released, the bl black line is the partial pressure of the CO2 and carbonation when CO2 pressure sinks because it's taken by the material. And we, real we realize this process with different number of cycles. I'm not going through all the details but uh, the study started in 2011 when I was, or 10, when I was at the University of Minnesota with one PhD and one master's uh, study. Then I moved to Australia, the project came with me to Australia, then we collaborated over Pacific, we built the reactor and the last experiments were finished during pandemics between lab shutdowns. The paper was accepted two weeks ago and after this long story is done. I thought this project will never end. Yes, I'm already finishing. I would like to conclude my presentation with two important uh, aspects of solar thermal research and broader. The first one is about solar ammonia. There is a lot of talk about pure hydrogen, hydrocarbons, but uh, nobody talks about actually how difficult, or perhaps a little bit, how difficult it is to deal with pure hydrogen as an end-user fuel. Hydrocarbons, on the other hand, if you want to use as a fuel, even if they are made from solar energy, you need to capture CO2 to uh, produce the fuel. There is the third way around to mitigate the problems of pure hydrogen and not to capture CO2 if we follow the ammonia route. The name comes from the Greek name Amon of, uh, of the Egyptian god Amun, which is the god of creation, and later on Amun fused with Ra, Ra is the solar god, so we have ammonia, creation and solar in the name of ammonia actually. The traditional process is based uh, on the high temperature, high pressure synthesis, the Haber-Bosch process, from nitrogen, hydrogen, so we need hydrogen source, and with ion as the catalyst. We have three most abundant materials on Earth. Nitrogen in the Earth, hydrogen in water, and ion in the core of the Earth, and the fourth most abundant material in the crust. Ammonia is much easier to handle than hydrogen, and it's also considered as the leading hydrogen vector to transport ammonia internationally. Okay? 
So there is also research going on on low temperature ammonia or low pressure ammonia to mitigate those extremely high gen, uh, um, pressures, more than 250 bars. It's called the brute force process and people are working on the gentle processes which would be more suitable to solar thermal energy, concentrated solar thermal energy. And finally, I would like to present or remind you about one concept especially that I think is very valuable right now when we have these energy problems around the world and especially in Europe now. Um, in 2003, there was the idea of desert tech coin to basically use deserts, Sahara mainly, um, to produce electricity and in various forms, mostly by using concentrated solar energy and to export it anywhere in the world. Right? There were studies done by, under the leadership of DLR by scientists from the uh, European Union, Middle East and North Africa countries together. They sat down, they estimated what it will take to supply heat, uh, to supply energy for the world. Uh, from Sahara um, and they come up with the ideas of different plants. So, so far only the plant in Morocco is the one that has been realized. Around 2010 the idea started to go down, photovoltaics was coming up and Europe thought we will not need any Sahara anymore. But, well, not so fast. The idea has been revived now because of the actually realizing that uh, Europe cannot produce all this solar energy domestically and Sahara is next door. And in fact, Sahara can provide much more than just Europe, as I mentioned, energy for the entire world. I think this is a very valuable idea and I think it's really worth uh, putting more effort into it, not only by Europe, but globally. And that is one way to mitigate all our um, energy problems. I would like to acknowledge my students, my postdoctoral fellows, different institutions, funding sources, and I have also shown four individuals with whom I have worked for many years on renewable energy in general, and then more specifically on solar, and then on radiative transfer, Professor Michael Modest and Leonid Dombrowski. Thank you very much for your attention. I took more time. <laughs>